Market Journal, television for agricultural business decisions, is a presentation of the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. everyone, I'm Troy Moling and thanks for joining us today on Market Journal. I hope everyone had a wonderful New Year's Day. Check this out, this is not only our first show of 2020, but also the 900th broadcast of Market Journal. So thanks for tuning in with us all these years. We've got a good show ahead for you this week and we're gonna make it a great 2020 as well. Beginning our broadcast and our first guest joins us from the bluegrass state of Kentucky. Market Journal caught up with Dr. Richard Preston before the end of the year when he was speaking at the Nebraska Soybean Day and Machinery Expo in Wahoo. Now, after studying at Yale and UC Berkeley, Richard went back home to Kentucky and has been farming there for over 40 years. And I began our conversation by asking him how his approach changes when he's speaking with an audience from Nebraska as opposed to one from Kentucky. It's really interesting. I think we share a lot of common problems and a lot of common values. Some of our biggest problems are like uh, political problems that affect all of us, but we have to remember that every, every person is different. Every person has a different type of risk that he needs to manage. So that's, that's one thing that we stress. We stress that any advice we give, we want it to be for you, not general advice that might work for somebody in Iowa, for example. You've given a talk called Decision Making in Uncertain Times. What are you telling producers that's different now than maybe a year or two ago? Well, what happens is, is, is change is constant. It seems like it's accelerating. We, we have to be prepared for uh, shocks that might come down the road. So we have to be prepared for these things. Things like the political landscape, all is becoming more uncertainty. Volatility is increasing all the time. So we need to try, or my, my offer is to try to smooth those crazy things out. I mean, things like uh, tariffs might, they just showed up. I mean, you know, and other things that are happening. And those are things we need to be prepared for. You also follow a lot of ag technology. What are some advancements you see in that field for 2020? Okay, well, it's, you know, ag tech, it just keeps, it moves forward and farmers need to understand how to use this information they're collecting. So one thing that, that I think as a, as a profession is we're getting all this good information. Now we need to get with extension sit down and say, well, what the heck does this all mean? And so I think that's what we're going to see. I think we're going to see uh, people figuring out more what all these yield variations mean and how we can address them. So I see that is coming. Richard, explain to us some ways you use science on your farm and some ways folks at home can do that too. You know, with the new technology, it's very useful, very easy to do these strip tests. Because with, uh, you know, what I can set up a, a, a system where I want to test one variety versus another. And I can go through with my, uh, because I have light bar or auto steer, I can go through and do this strip and then, then over here strip three. So, and then come back and fill them in. It's very easy to do on-farm research now. Uh, Nebraska has a program where they connect with farmers and they do that analysis for you. I, I do them my own analysis, but you know, not everybody can do statistics, probability. But any, any, all states are getting to where they can take that information on your farm and then turn it into useful information. Finally, and this can go for corn or soybeans or something else. For those producers watching, can you give us some final marketing advice or risk management tips to start off the new year? Well, I, I think everybody needs to look at their own situation and that's, that's not a cop-out, that's just the way it really is. Look at your own situation, and when the market offers you a profit, and you can start to, to hedge into that market, don't, don't, go, don't bet the farm on one, one deal. Do gradually, and try to, try to set out your, sale, your sales program uh, with 
many different times that you sell. So, you know, I like to say that I like to make a lot of little mistakes instead of one big one. So that that's a key, just sort of average out your marketing and you know, what not to do, and for people in economic distress, what not to do is to just cut cost where it really cuts production. You don't have to shoot for the high yield, but you do need to keep that, you do need to keep putting your fertilizer and things on so you meet that reasonable production level. Thanks again to Richard for the great conversation. Next up, and we're not going to have to wait too much longer for the first major USDA report of the new year. Mark your calendar because Jeff Peterson of Heartland Farm Partners has a rundown of what he's watching and what you should be watching too. You know, the next big one is going to be the January 10th report. And on that January 10th report, everybody's going to really be looking at what is USDA going to do on their acres and their yields, production, any adjustments on the demand on the WASD report. But it actually carries more significance than even that. You've also got quarterly stock numbers. And keep in mind, these quarterly stock numbers are as of December 1st. So probably the most controversial point that will come out of that is the fact that when you go back and say, well, as of December 1st, there was probably 900 million bushels of corn yet out in the field. How will that corn get counted? Well, what NASA's told us our common practice is, is that they will go ahead and count that or ask the farmer to include that in his on-farm stock. So there'll, there'll be some definitely some numbers to look at there. Then from there, what we have to keep our eye on is we know in the latter part of January, the Congressional Budget Office will come out with some of their projections. Not a lot of attention paid to that. And then we've got on February 20th and 21st, we'd have the Outlook meeting. And the Outlook meeting by USDA, that'll be the first shot. It won't be a survey-based shot, but it'll be the first shot at what some of the acres look like for next year. And then, of course, going out a little bit further, we're out to March 31st. Then we get our planning and intentions report and our quarterly stocks report again. So those are the ones we need to keep in the front of our mind as we go forward. And we'll be covering them and keeping you up to date as they happen too. Next up, some farmers in Nebraska are hoping that hops can help them diversify their fields. Hops isn't a crop that's normally grown in this state. In fact, it's more popular in the Pacific Northwest, where its role in making beer helps in meeting the demand of the large number of microbreweries there. Now, researchers in Nebraska are trying to leverage falling commodity prices and the state's own growing craft beer industry to expand the crop's footprint. UNL professor Stacy Adams is always on the lookout for something special. Well, my expertise is, is specialty crop production. So when he was introduced to the hop plant, he had to know how it would work here. We're looking at alternative crops suitable for Nebraska as an opportunity for farmers to diversify their farm income. It may look like an out-of-control vine, but hops is teeming with possibilities for Nebraska farmers. I tell you what, this plant is, is kind of an extremely unique plant because it does have a perennial underground. It has an annual top growth. It's day length sensitive uh, and temperature sensitive. And so, you know, a lot of us consider a plant to go through these stages, you know, just kind of uniform, one to the next to the next. And this plant just has so many variables with it, which makes it extremely challenging, um, but quite interesting one to work with. The first thing you notice is the size. The hop plant is tall and can shoot up to over 20 feet in a month's time. But the real treasure is the tiny flowers hidden behind its leaves. They're also called cones and play a role in manufacturing beer and herbal remedies. The interest in hops with me was not only that it's um, used oftentimes for flavoring in beer uh, or the bittering that they, they have in that, but there's multiple uh, other opportunities in it. And one of the things is that they collect the oils and um, those can be marketed to be used in um, uh, phar uh, pharmaceutical uh, medicines, alternative medicines or holistic type medicines. Um, we have found also that it's being used in, in floral production. So there's just uh, multiple things that you can use it for. It's that opportunity for diversification that has some farmers wanting to learn more. Nebraska Extension has also created a hop coordinator program to educate and work with growers on how to produce a quality hop product that can be sold. Where are you going to sell them? 
that's been the biggest challenge for growers um, is the market. Um, and a lot of times that involves uh, starting small and establishing you know, that quality product and then working with brewers. Having a relationship with the brewer, and that can be a big challenge. Um, you know, they can't just call up a brewer and say, hey, I have some hops, would you buy them? Um, you know, there really needs to be a relationship established first. Another challenge has been figuring out the best way to get the crop to grow in Nebraska's environment. The state has about 50 total acres of hops, including plots on UNLZ's campus and in Cass, Valley, and Buffalo counties. However, the research suggests that if you want the best possible yield from this crop, go west. Western Nebraska, that is. We have multiple researchers looking at different aspects. Climatic situation is, is, a, is a big struggle. So we have a project that's uh, in the, the planning stages right now for North Platte. We see the western side of Nebraska that we're getting the best performance and uh, consistency of quality. Latitude is really important. Day length is really important for hops. So we fall kind of just outside of that 45 to 50 um, degree latitude, which is considered ideal for hop production. So we still have the day length to where we can really, uh, we can produce hops well. And as long as you have irrigation, um, they seem to perform uh, quite well out there and don't really have any disease or pest issues. In addition to tracking the research, Katie has been instrumental in getting other members of the burgeoning hops community on board. With uh, the breeding program, um, Nebraska has a lot of wild hops um, across the state and um, so as kind of word has gotten out about the breeding program, um, people have you know, contacted us and say, you know, we have a wild hop here or there and um, we are able to go and make some collections um, and, you know, hopefully those will be incorporated into the breeding program. And if everything proves successful, maybe one day you'll be enjoying a drink in Nebraska that was locally grown. It's important to remember that patience is key when growing hops. It takes about three years to reach full harvest, and after that, the cones have to be dried and made into pellets. Katie tells me that's an area that still needs more research, and it's a story we'll continue to track. Time now for this week's trivia question, and it's a pretty sweet one. Here we go. In its lifetime of three weeks, how much honey will a honeybee produce? Is the answer one twelfth of a teaspoon, one tenth of a teaspoon, one sixth of a teaspoon, or is it half a teaspoon? Make your guess and I'll have the answer after Al's forecast. Moving on and building soil health, profitability, and soil fertility is not something that happens overnight. Scott and Pam Heineman of Windside transitioned from feeding cattle and conventional no-till corn and soybeans to a new system. It's one that adds small grains and cover crops and is more of a marathon than a sprint. So how'd the Heinemans get here? Well, in 2006, they did some soul searching about the future of their operation. They decided to exit the cattle feeding business and add diversity and cover crops to their systems. Read about the changes they've made in the January Nebraska Farmer. It's time now for weather with Nebraska Extension Ag Climatologist and Market Journal Chief Meteorologist Al Dutcher. Happy 2020, Al. What's in the forecast to begin the year? Well, Troy, here we again for the weekly forecast. And of course, the first first cut of the year, kind of a little edgy about this since we've been away from the models for about 10 days. But overall, it looks like a fairly benign pattern for us in the center part of the country. Most of the activity will be toward the east. Post uh, Christmas Day storm, 12 to 15 inches with the biggest totals just to the north of Grand Island that we've seen so far, 7 to 12 inches around that area, coupled with the high winds. We've seen some pretty significant travel delay issues and of course the interstate shut down to the north and to the northeast. Much more significant snowfall also occurred in the Dakotas, Minnesota and up to the upper peninsula of Michigan. While south of there we had exceptionally heavy rainfall. So after we've had a couple of months of drying for most of the state, now we're right back in the same position as we were going into the harvest with soil conditions. So let's hope that we have an improving condition that at least holds off significant moisture for a few more weeks. Now in terms of what's going on presently, 
that that trough that moved through yesterday has deepened in the, e in the eastern United States, bringing cold air down into the eastern Corn Belt. Our next system is coming down the pipeline and will be moving through the state over the next 24-hour period. We have a low pressure system developing in eastern Colorado, but we just don't have enough Gulf moisture feed fast enough to really have an impact. So most of what we're going to be looking at is flurry activity. And then by the midday period on uh, tomorrow, we're going to try to see the system all the way to the east of us impacting the eastern Corn Belt. Another low pressure tries to develop in eastern Colorado, but this one's going to sag more toward the southeast and not really have an impact impact as we see flurry activity across the mountains and some snow in the Pacific Northwest. So now we start to see this trough deepening as the cold air sinks to the south. So Monday and Tuesday will probably be our coolest days of the week across the state. And we're only going to be uh, right around normal to a couple degrees below normal. Low pressure over the eastern Dakotas doesn't have any moisture to work with. So again, most of the moisture confined to the northern Rockies. On Tuesday, though, this system really starts to dig a big, deep trough. And this is going to generate a very powerful system across the eastern United States as low pressure starts to move up the eastern side of the Appalachians. We're going to see expanding snowfall from Iowa all the way down to Alabama and then up the eastern seaboard and it'll really get cranking on Wednesday in the northeast as this low pressure system brings heavy snow and cold air. In our region we'll be looking at low pressure developing in the eastern portions of Colorado once again but this system is going to di dive down to the south. Most of the precipitation at this point will be up in the Pacific Northwest but as we get into Thursday the system starts to broad out in the upper atmosphere that's going to take this leading low pressure system at the surface in the Texas Panhandle up into the Great Lakes region so we start to see precipitation breaking out across eastern Texas and Oklahoma as we get in the second half of Thursday, rapidly expanding toward the northeast as we go through the day on Friday as a low pressure develops in eastern Oklahoma and then moves rapidly toward the Great Lakes, bringing heavy precipitation to the south of the low pressure system. And then we'll also be looking at a very significant line of heavy snowfall accumulation possible, particularly from eastern Kansas all the way up into northern Michigan, just barely clipping or missing the southeastern part of the state. Eight to 14 day forecast shows that the next big trough coming in, which may be our big mid month weather maker, colder than normal conditions in terms of precipitation with such a strong system above normal moisture for the entire United States. So, Troy, it looks like we're going to get by this next week with fairly normal conditions, and then we have a very cold, stormy pattern by mid month. Thanks, Al. Back to trivia now. And this week we asked, how much honey will one honeybee produce during its three week lifespan? If you guessed A, you got it right. One twelfth is the right answer. Next up, today there are about 7.7 .7 billion people living on the planet, and that's a lot of mouths to feed. Despite slowing global birth rates, by the year 2050 that number is estimated at 9.7 billion people. And this isn't lost on educators here at the University of Nebraska. Utilizing a three-year, nearly $1 million grant from the National Science Foundation, Dr. J.M. Sabaya is leading a team trying to stimulate interest in the food energy water nexus through gaming. Here's Market Journal's Bill Dodd. Work on that while maybe you play the games a little bit. The year is 2050. Our population has grown by 2 billion people and our agricultural sustainability is at risk. That's the premise of a new game being created by UNL professor J.M. Sabaya and his team on the East Campus of UNL. So the game is about teaching youth about systems thinking and uh, trying to teach about the complexities involved in the act production, how different systems are interconnected, and how they could use science-based decision-making to solve the, solve the problems of food production in the world, feeding the whole world. The idea came to Sabaya while he was watching his son and his friends play the popular video game Madden and seeing that they could virtually change the outcome of past Super Bowl matchups. And they were trying to change the outcome of the game. They were replaying the fourth quarter and then change the outcome of the game. When they were playing, I thought that like, well, we have the science-based model for crop production, mm -hmm. the hydrology, the climatology, and the beef pro growth, all of those things we have. So and we have all the data, market economy data, everything for the last 30, 40, 50 years, complete data set. So can somebody go back and then play those scenario out? Can they make a sustainable decisions to change the outcome? And can we even forecast and go until 2050 and feed the growing population? The game utilizes crop growth models, weather records, all available weather models, and soil profiles, among other data that goes through an output model. 
Meanwhile, the player is saddled with the task of deciding what crops to grow, irrigation management, fertilizers, breeds of plants, livestock, about every other agricultural decision one would have to make in an actual farming scenario. However, you don't need to be an ag expert to play. So our goal is to make sure that this game is attractive for the urban kids too, right? If we just make, for, uh, make entertaining for the rural kids, then it's a failure. So we want to teach the urban kids that ag is a high tech and a high risk profession. And you can use model based decisions and then they can solve big challenges in this world. So far, this project is two and a half years in the making and has relied heavily on student support to see it come to fruition. One of those students is biological systems engineer major and Los Angeles native, Ashley Slattery. Lincoln, Nebraska is the smallest town I've ever lived in. I grew up in Los Angeles, California, so, and I know nothing about agriculture, um, but it's, it's been fun, you know, um, learning about it through this process. And, you know, I've had to Google, like, how big is a tractor? Because I just didn't know that. So it's a learning experience. With a fantastic concept and a team of bright young students leading the way on programming, this game has the potential to influence an entirely new generation of ag enthusiasts. Reporting for Market Journal, I'm Bill Dodd. Like The Sims or other game simulations, Agpocalypse 2050 allows players the chance to build their agricultural enterprise. One of the best features of the game, however, is the educational aspect. Should a player need assistance, a game character will appear as an educator or specialist from Nebraska Extension, offering finer details of production while also offering web links to learn more about each topic. That's pretty cool. Finally today, Market Journal has a lot of viewers who also watch Backyard Farmer, so we wanted to take a few minutes to congratulate the team over there for a pretty big milestone. The Backyard Farmer Garden on UNL's East Campus recently celebrated 10 years of planting, digging, weeding, and a lot of fun. Landscape horticulture specialist Kim Todd and Nebraska Extension educator Terry James talk about how the garden came to be. If you've watched us on Backyard Farmer or you've heard us on Backyard Farmer, you know that Terry and I are absolutely the boots on the ground and instrumental in the Backyard Farmer garden. And we thought it would really be fun to talk about both our experience in how we got this accomplished and then what you see when you come to visit and maybe give you a little bit of cautionary note about what you can and cannot do when you come to the Backyard Farmer garden. So Terry, the first piece was this piece, which happened before before you got here, so what do you think? Well, I think it's good. I mean, this is basically what we need for plant ID for students, but also for the homeowner, for them to be able to see more landscape size shrubs, perennials, those kinds of things permanent in your yard that would fit in, in a homeowner's backyard. And this is all perennial, and so 14 or 15 years worth of additions, subtractions, reversions, which again is what we would really expect a homeowner to, to experience in their own home landscape. So how about the next piece, <laughs> which is actually celebrating its 10 years in existence? So the Backyard Farmer Garden started in 2009, um, right after I got here. Uh, it started out as a 10 by 10 plot, and the reason it started was because we um, got the All-America Selection winter display garden here. We needed a place to put it. So we dug up a 10 by 10 spot, which every homeowner should do is start small and add on. And that's what we've done. And then that piece, which is the annual piece, 
I seem to recall something about a giant pile of compost and topsoil. Yep, we, we did everything the right way. We may have timed it a little bit differently um, just because of having to get stuff in the ground. But yes, we turned the soil over. We did use a, a big tiller um, on the back of a tractor. Um, but we did turn it all over mechanically, then we added 20 yards of compost by hand. So 10 years later, or actually eight years later, seven, we added the rain chain across the front, which is I think going into its fourth fall. Yep. And that again gives our homeowners another piece, which is you too could capture the rain. Yep. So that one works too? I, it works really well. We've been out here on some major rain storms um, here in Lincoln. We know that it works, it holds the water, um, it helps clean the water as the water goes through the soil profile. It adds another dimension to our garden. So we, we love our visitors to the backyard farmer garden. What would we both like to tell them? Um, I would tell them they need to visit multiple times a year. Yes. Um, between putting the annuals in, the springtime uh, perennials that bloom, annuals coming in, and then the rain chain really is in its prime in the fall. So it visit at least once a month, if possible. And park north of the building on the weekend? Yep, or... free parking on campus on yeah. weekends. Yeah. A little bit harder during school when students are here. Um, a little bit easier in the summertime, but you still have to do pay, you still have to pay for parking during the week. Exactly. And of course, to all of our loyal fans, tell us you love us because we love to hear that in the backyard farmer garden. And we're hoping for many more years to come. The backyard farmer garden is located at 3850 Center Street on UNL's East Campus in Lincoln. That's going to do it for this week's show. If you missed a story, be sure to download the Market Journal mobile app or follow us on social media to join in on the conversation. Next week, Darren Newsom will be our market analyst, and anytime is a good time to be thinking about soil health, we'll tell you about some new research. Until next time, I'm Troy Moling. Thanks for watching, and here's to a great 2020. Join Market Journal online at marketjournal.unl.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Promotional support is provided by the Nebraska Farmer Magazine. Market Journal is produced by the University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources.